Hi. So we're going to start the next section, which is on vector valued functions. Um, so th before we get into what these vector valued functions are, let's just r review a little bit about uh, parametric equations. So you should all recognize something like this. This is just a line. In fact, this is a line in a plane. We also talked about lines in space. Something like this, right? 0 plus 3t. So this would be a line in space, right? right. But um, it, they don't have to be lines. So for example, if you have, let's just do the ordinary parabola, y equals x squared. And maybe we can do a very rough graph of that, right? Something like that, right? Um, so, of course, we can represent this parametrically by just saying, well, we can say x is t, and then y, since y is x squared, x squared is t squared, right? So this is the same parabola, just represented parametrically. Although, I, again, if we want the entire parabola, then we have to specify, right? x goes from negative infinity to positive infinity, so t, of course, would be, sorry, not equals, uh, would range from negative infinity to positive infinity. In other words, t could be any real number, right? Um, the nice thing is if you only want to talk about, let's say, this part of the parabola, let's say from x equals negative 1 to x equals positive 2, then you can do that by just specifying t varies between negative 1 and 2. Right? So that would be a, a particular piece of the parabola. Right? And so when we talk about a line, of course, we're talking about the infinite line. If we only go from, say, t equals 0 to t equals 5, then that's a line segment. Right? So from starting at one point and ending at another point would be a line segment. Um, right. Now, keep in mind that these are not unique. You can represent the same line or even the line segment using a different set of parametric equations. And likewise, we can also represent the parabola using a different set of parametric equations. Um, if you want a slightly different one, you can say um, x is equal to t squared, and then y is equal to t to the fourth. Hang on, I take that back. That's not going to be the same thing. Um, x is equal to t cubed, and y is going to be t to the 6. That would represent the same parabola. Um, oh, so what was wrong with what I had earlier? If x is equal to t squared and y is equal to t to the fourth, why is that not the same parabola? So think about what happens now. If t is negative, right, if you're going from negative infinity to positive infinity, if t is, let's say, negative 2, the next will be positive 4, right? In other words, x would have to be positive, right? So, right, so your graph is only going to be this half of the parabola, right? So you're missing the left half um, because we you know, you're cutting off where t is, where x is negative, right? So when you have t cubed, that can be positive or negative. So yes, yeah, so you have to be careful, right? Um, this, this parametrization, if you will, only represents the right half of the parabola here. So, right. Um, you know, and of course you can represent a circle parametrically as well. Uh, let's just say it's the unit circle, so radius 1. Um, right? the, probably one of the worst ways of doing it is to solve for y. Right? And then to say, well, let x be t. Right? Then y is going to be, so here's the issue. You have plus or minus the square root of 1 minus t squared. So that's not quite as nice because you essentially have to split the circle up into 
you know, the top half of the circle and then the bottom half of the circle, right, where the, the plus would be the, the blue and the minus would be the purple. Um, so not quite as nice. Right? So honestly, if you want to represent a circle, the best way is just to right, use polar coordinates. Um, so instead of theta, we'll use t. So x is cosine of t and y is sine of t. Right. So that would be probably the best way. Well, it's, it's a different way. And it just gives you a nicer parametrization. So here, if you want the entire circle, we only have to go from t equals 0 to pi over 2. And for that, you go all the way around just once. If you only want the top half of the circle, then you can just specify that t ranges from 0 to pi, for example. And that would be the top half of the circle. Right? So, so yeah, by varying t, same parameterization, but you get different portions of the circle. OK. Again, this is nothing new. right? Um, but what might be new is if you want, let's say you want one of these things. Oh, this is not, not quite what I wanted here. That's a little better, right? So like a spiral, right? Mathematically, we call this a helix, right? And so a helix is a curve, but it's a curve in space, right? It's not the plane curve that does this, right? Think of a circle that just, you know, goes upward, right? A point moving along a circle that has a sort of a vertical component to it, a z component to it. So we can represent that parametrically as well in a very similar way to a circle. Now we just have to specify what z is doing. And if z is going up, let's say, let's just say it's equal to t, then this would be a good parametric representation of the helix. OK. So what does this all have to do with vectors? After all, this is section is on vector valued functions, right? So we can treat the x, y, and z as just coordinates of a point, right? So coordinates of a point either on the circle or on the helix here. So each coordinate has x and y, or if you're in space, x, y, and z. Or we can think about those points as being the endpoints of a vector from the origin. So wherever the origin is here, you have a vector from that point to that point. Right? So if we write this as the components of a vector, those components, of course, will depend on t. Right? Right. Or if you prefer, x of t times i plus y of t times j, plus z of t times k. Right? So we're going to use r. Again, don't get confused with r like the radius or the, you know, r as the uh, polar coordinates. Not the same r. Right? So we're simply using r as a function of t here. Right. And we don't have to use R. You can also use U or V. Well, don't use V because we're going to use that later. But U is another one that we can use. Um, right. So these are vector-valued functions. They're functions of T whose values are vectors. Right. So at each T, right, for a different T, you're specifying a different vector. So let's just take an easy example here. Um, suppose r is the vector valued function 2 times t, 3 times t, 5 times t. Right? So what would r evaluated at 3 be? Well, if t is 3, this is 2 times 3 is 6, 3 times 3 is 9, 5 times 3 is 15. And this would be a single vector, right? But for a different t, you'll get a, right, you'll get a different value. You'll get a different vector. 
So for example, when t is 4, you get the vector 8, 12, 20. Right? So, yeah. so if you sort of trace different values of t, oh, this might be a very bad drawing here. So let's, let's try it this way. Suppose this is the x-axis. This will be the y-axis. This will be the z-axis. This might look a little better. So what, what is this? Right? What is this the, the graph of? If we extend t forever, in other words, t goes from negative infinity to infinity, what is the graph going to look like? So notice when t is 0, you're at the origin. You're at 0, 0. Right? Then you get when t is 3, you're at a different point, and a different point, and so on. So yes, of course, this is just going to trace out a line in space. Right? This is, after all, just the parametric equations for a line. We could write them separately, like this. Right? So x0, y0, and z0 are all equal to 0. And that's the, right, when that happens, you get the origin as being on your line. So that's one point on the line corresponding to t equals 0, right? And this point might correspond to t equals 3 and so on, right? But now we're only, we're all, right, we're only extending this to the idea that each point is the endpoint of a vector. So if you want the endpoint to be a vector, and maybe I should use a different color here, right? So that vector is just getting longer and longer as t goes forward. So the advantage of this, right, whether you represent it as you know, parametric equations of a line or a vector-valued function, you get the same result. Right? You get a line traced out in space. Right? But there's an even bigger advantage in that each point gives you a different vector or a different point. A different t gives you a different point or a different vector. So what happens as time moves along is the following. You get the point say starting here, let's say t equals 0, and then when t is, you know, half a second later, you're here, and then a half a second later, you're here. So as time goes forward, this point is just moving, right? And it's just moving in a straight line in, in this example. But in this example, the point might be moving in a spiral or in a circle or in a parabola, right? So it just depends on how your vector valued function is defined, right? So, so you can think of t as, as time, and then each point, x, y, z, as a point, right, travels through time. So you're representing motion of some object, right? Right. And w again, whether you think of it as a point or the endpoint of a vector starting at the origin, although the origin is here, so it should be this vector. Sorry about that. Um, right. It still produces motion. Right. Um, and again, we'll get back to that later. Uh, in this video, we're just going to study the properties of these vector-valued functions. Right. And let's look at maybe one more example. Okay, so here's another one, right? Um, so these are just the three components of this vector. We can think of this as the x component, right? The y component and the z component, right? So we could write out the three equations separately. x equals 1 plus t, y equals t squared, and z is equal to the square root of t minus 1. Let me fix that. Right. So this traces out some path in space. And it's pretty clear this is not going to be a line, right? When you have t squared, that's not a linear function, right? So it's just cur some curve, right, traced out in space. I know it's very hard for me to draw in space, but pretend, you know, that this might be the shadow of the curve here. It might do something like that, um, right? So then this would be sort of the z if this is the xy plane, right? 
Um, so it looks like it's, inter it's crossing itself, but it doesn't have to be, right? Think of like the helix. It's not really crossing itself, right? Because um, from a different point of view, it might be doing this, right? So, so yeah, it's, this point is not meant to be an intersection, um, right? It's just, it's just going over it in some other location, right? Yeah, again, hard to do, right? But if this is the origin, then each value of t gives you a different vector. Oh, and that, that's supposed to be the point where it might cross, right? So, so again, this is a vector-valued function. For each, for each t, you get a different vector, right? right. Um, however, we have to be careful about this because we can't say that t can be anything, right? In particular, look at the z coordinate here, the z component, I should say, squared of t minus one. Well, if if t is zero, or less than one, uh, less than zero, then this is going to be an imaginary number. No imaginary numbers, not in this course, right? So what we're going to have to do here is specify the the domain. In order for t minus one to be greater than or equal to zero, t would have to be greater than or equal to one. So so the domain of this vector valued function is going to be right from 1 to infinity right in other words t is greater than or equal to 1 so t could be 1 you can get z equals 0 but if t is less than 1 then you're going to get an imaginary number for z and that's that's pretty hard to think about an imaginary vector right right so essentially the domain then has to be the domain of the intersection of all these functions, right? So you can imagine a different example, right? So let's say let's say we only have two components, right? X and X and Y. Um, in fact, I'll write it this way, right? Suppose I have the square root of t times i um, plus the square root of uh, let's do oh. All right, so negative 1 minus t times j. All right, so what would be the domain? Well, if you're doing the square root of t, t better be greater than or equal to 0, right? And if you want this to be positive, 1 minus t, ha uh, one, a negative 1 minus t has to be greater than or equal to 0. But that means negative t has to be greater than or equal to negative 1, which means t has to be less than or equal to positive 1. Okay, so t has to be greater than 0, but less than 1. So this function is only defined for these values of t. Right? Yeah, so, so in fact, you can come up with a function that's not defined for any t, but yeah, so you're only allowed to plug in, say, 0 or 1. Uh, oh, wait a minute. I did this way too fast, didn't I? All right, back up, back up. This, this can't be right. Um, negative 1 minus t is greater than or equal to 0. So negative t is greater than or equal to 1, which means t is less than or equal to negative 1. Yeah, OK. So right. So, so this, is, this is basically the empty set. T can't be anything, right? You can't be less than negative 1 and bigger than 0 at the same time, right? These are inconsistent, right? So effectively, this is a vector-valued function for no values of T, right? So t, t is the, right, T can't be any real number, right? So this is what's called the empty set. Um, it's the set of no values of T. So you can't plug in anything for t, so you don't get anything, right? So this is, again, this should not happen in the real world. This, it would be ridiculous to even define such a function because you can't plug in any value of t at all, right? If you plug in a positive t, it'll work for the, you'll get an x-coordinate, but no y-coordinate. And if you plug in a t less than negative 1, you'll get a y-coordinate, but no x-coordinate. So you don't get anything, right? So, yeah, so... So all I was trying to say is, right, the, 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 the t's that are in the domain have to be satisfied by all three components, or all two components, if you have 
a curve in a plane. Right. Um, right. So let's go, let's get something a little more familiar. This is one we've seen before. Um, in fact, let's make the radius 5. So 5 times cosine t and 5 times sine t. And let's suppose t varies between 0 and, pi, and 2 pi. Um, you don't have to make it equal to 2 pi because that's where it starts. So this is just the vector valued function of a circle of radius 5. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. Right, and it's going counterclockwise, right? Yep, so one complete circle from 0 to 2 pi. Um, right, so here t, you know, we're, spe we're specifying the domain of t here. t could be all real numbers, but what that means is you're just going around the circle over and over and over again. So if you want the full circle, you only have to go from 0 to, to 2 pi. If you want two circles, go from 0 to 4 pi, and so on, right? right. So, so what can we do, right? We can evaluate this for various values of t. So let's make, let's make a nice number here. How about t is pi over 3? So this is just 5 times cosine of pi over 3. 5 times sine pi over 3. Right. So what is this vector? It's the vector 5 over 2, 5 square root of 3 over 2. If I got that right, I think that's correct. Right. So that would be, roughly speaking, that would be this vector here, because this angle is pi over 3. Right. So in this case, t is actually the angle that you get with the with the positive x-axis, okay? But just be aware it doesn't have to be. So for example, or another example, I'll call it u, suppose we have 5 times cosine of 4t, 5 sine of 4 times t, right? So instead of t, we're just multiplying it by 4. Right? So it's the same circle. Right? But if you want the whole circle, you don't have to go all the way from 0 to 2 pi. All you have to do is go from 0 to pi over 2. Okay, so, so what's the difference? Right? It's, it's the same circle. Right? What's different is the motion. Right? For, the, for the green circle up here, for r, if you go from 0 to 2 pi, so that's 0 to roughly 6.28, Right, so think about 6.28 six seconds. It takes me about 6 seconds to go all the way around. I don't know, was that 6 seconds? Close enough, right? But now for you, for the blue curve here, it's still the same circle, but now pi over 2 is about 1.5. So it only takes me 1.5 seconds to go all the way around. So in some sense, you get the same circle, you get the same graph, if you will, but the motion is different, right? The motion for you is like four times as fast as the motion for R. Make sense? So yeah, in this case, if T is time, right, it's not the angle anymore. In other words, if t is pi over 3 in this, in this example, then the angle, theta, is actually 4 pi over 3, which is, which is down here now, right? So yeah, pi over 3 is the t, but 4 pi over 3 is the angle. Okay, so just don't get confused between t and the angle. They don't have to be the same. Okay, so this is going to be our vector-valued function right, in space, uh, again, if you just want a, a, a curve in a plane, then you don't need the z component. Then you just have the two components, the x and the y. Okay. So, yeah, whether you want to write it, right, as a linear combination of the i, j, and k, or in what I call component form with x, y, and z, like this, in, in between the, 
right, the angled brackets here. It's right, this is a vector valued function. Right, and again, what do we know about a function is you have to specify the domain. What are you allowed to plug in for t? Right, can t be any real number or is t only between say zero and two or something like that? Right, so, so yes, you, you, you know, if you don't specify the domain, then we're just assuming that it's all real numbers, okay? Um, so we're using t. T is, t is called a parameter. Right? I said earlier it could represent time, but it doesn't have to be time. In fact, it doesn't have to be t. Uh, we could use different letters instead of for our parameters. We don't have to use t. Um, but most of the time we will use t. Another, another letter we're going to use later is S instead of T for our parameter, but we'll come to that a little bit later. Okay. Yeah, so this is our vector-valued function. Um, what else can we do with functions? We can take limits. So let's suppose we take the limit as T approaches, um, let's use C, of R of T. What is this limit? Well, if it exists, right, if the limit exists, it's got to be the limit of the component functions, right? In other words, x of t is just an ordinary single-valued function that you, sorry, it's not x, it's t now. t approaches c, right? So x of t, right, just think of like f of x, right? It's a regular function. Right, it's, but it's a function of t instead of x, right? right? And so this is just a function times the vector i, right? And then the same thing is true here. You take the limit as t approaches c of the y component, multiplied by j, and then the limit as t approaches c of the z component, times the vector k. Okay, and that's, that's basically what we mean by the limit as t approaches c of a vector-valued function. You just take the limit of each component function. So for this limit to exist, right, if this limit exists, what it means is that all three of these limit has to ex all three of these limits must also exist. Right? This exists and this exists. If any one of them does not exist, then the whole thing does not exist. Right? Even if one of them exists or two of them exists, if all three don't exist, or if one of them does not exist, or two of them does not exist, then the limit for the whole vector-valued function does not exist. Right? Same thing with the domain. Right? If, if t is in the domain of x and z, but it's not in the domain of y, then it's not in the domain of r, the whole thing. So, right, so that's just the idea of a limit, and, you know, we, we don't have to go through an example because I, I think it should be clear here. Um, well, okay, here's an example. Um, suppose r of t is 2 times t, t to the 3, and e to the t. Right. So let's find the limit as t approaches 1 of r of t. Well, you're just taking the limit as t approaches 1 of 2 times t, and then the limit as t approaches 1 of t cubed, and then the limit as t approaches 1 of e to the t. And you can do those in your head, right? You just get 2, 1, e. Remember, e is the number 2.71828 and so on, right? e to the 1. Right. So that's, yeah. Obviously, all these limits exist. If we had something like a square root um, or a natural log, then you have to be a little more careful. Right. Um, so the next thing we want to talk about is um, a function, a vector-valued function, being continuous. So we say that this vector-value function is continuous 
at a specific value of t, let's say t is equal to c, and that's going to be true if the limit as t approaches c of r of t is the same thing you get if you just plug in c into the vector valued function, into r. Right? So, yeah. So, right, if this is not clear, you can unpack this. You can just rewrite this in terms of all three components. Right? So, r is basically going to be continuous at c if x of t, y of t, and z of t, all three of these, are continuous right, at c. If any one of them is not continuous at c, then the entire thing is not continuous. Right. Um, and this is continuity at a specific value of c, but you can talk about continuity for all t or for a specific interval. So, right, so you can say r of t is continuous on the interval, let's just say i, and it could be an open interval or a closed interval. Let's say it's a closed interval, let's just say between a and b. Right. Um, so this, this this just means, right? This is if R is continuous for each t between a and b, right? Including a and b in this case. Right. So for each t on on the interval, for each t on the interval i, I should have said. Um, yeah, that's, that's all it is, right? So it's just continuity of the three, of the three component functions, or two component functions if there's only two. Right. And maybe you can see where this is headed, right? Once you talk about limits and continuity, then you might be able to talk about you know, derivatives. So we'll get to that in the next video. Uh, for this video, I just want to maybe do a few more examples and just, uh, you know, explore these vector-valued functions and their graphs. And I think this is a good example uh, to see the sort of the difference between motion, right, of particles or of objects moving along the paths and then the, and then the paths themselves, right? In other words, the curves that they're traced out by. So we have two vector valued functions, r and u, right? So here we have r, right? That's one vector valued function. That'll trace out one curve, right? And then we have um, u, which will trace out the green curve. And we have two particles, a and b, moving along paths traced out by r and u respectively. So a is moving along the curve traced by r, b is moving along the curve traced by u. Right, so the first question is, right, do these two particles collide? Right, do they crash into each other? Right. So, right, so in other words, um, for any given time, let's say t0, right, do those two particles occupy the same the same uh, point in space, right? Is it at the endpoint of the same vector? So does that happen, right? So this is for part A. Right, so we just set them equal to each other, right? And I'm, I, I guess I prefer to use this symbol, this notation here. Right. So does that equal this? Okay, so when are two vectors equal? Right? Two vectors are equal when both of their components are equal. This has to equal this, right? And then this has to equal this. The x components have to be equal and the y components have to be equal. So are the y components equal? Well, they can be, right? You solve this and you get two solutions. You get zero and one. 
right? So that's for the second component, I should say, right? That's for, that's for that. What about the first component? Will the first components ever be equal to each other? No, of course not, right? You can subtract t0 from both sides and you get 0 equals negative 2, which is decidedly false. For any value of t, this will never happen. Okay, so, so the answer here is no. The particles do not collide. Right? They are not going to occupy the same point in space at the same time. So these will not be equal. And so the answer is no. Right? These, right, these, are, these are not equal for any t. Okay. So that's one question you can ask. The second question, part b, do their paths intersect? Right? So part b asks about the paths that they trace. So what is the, the first particle trace? So let's, let's essentially draw their graphs here. Um, and again, these are both in the plane, so the xy plane is good enough. Um, two, oh, I think I need one more here. Um, okay, so y, all right, so here's 4, here's y. All right, close enough. Um, so let's start with, um, yes, r. Oops. So r was what? It was, yeah, t, t squared. So in other words, x is t, y is t squared, but if t is x, then y is x squared. Right, so this is just y equals x squared. And we know what that looks like. That's why I needed the, the 2, 4 here. And I think I can do a slightly better job than that. Yep. And again, t could be anything, positive or negative. So it's the full parabola here, right? All right, so what about... The second one, the second one was u, which was t minus 2t. Uh, so t minus 2 and t. So let's see, x is t minus 2 and y is t. But what's t, right? t is going to be x plus 2. So y is just going to be x plus 2. Right? And we know what that is, right? That's just a line. The y-intercept is 2, the slope is 1, so we get this line here, close enough. So remember, this is for u of t, and the yellow one is for r, uh, yellow or orange, I guess it doesn't matter here, is for r of t. So do their paths intersect? Well, clearly, right? I mean, I can see two points of intersection. One's here and one is up here, right? So, yeah, so to answer this question, it's a little bit trickier, right? We have to essentially find the intersection of y equals x plus 2 and y equals x squared. So when you set the y's equal to each other, you get x squared equals x plus 2. And you solve that quadratic equation. And I think you get this, right? So you either get x equals negative 1 or x equals 2. And if x is negative 1, what's y? Well, if you're doing x squared, it's going to be positive 1. Right? If you're doing x plus 2, it's also positive 1. Now, if x is 2, you get 2 plus 2 is 4. or Right? Or you, you can do 2 squared is also 4. So there you go, right? Those are the two points, negative 1, 1. So that's, that's this point right here, negative 1, 1. And then the other point is 2, 4. That's the, this point right here has coordinates 2 and 4. So 
the answer to the second question, do the paths intersect? And the answer is definitely yes. And if so, where? Actually, it happens twice. Once at negative 1, 1, and also at 2, 4. Okay. So does that make sense? Right? The two paths intersect. Now, that doesn't mean that the particles collide. Why not, right? So if, right, if, if, if the paths are, right, have this, these points of intersection, how is it that the two particles then don't collide? Right. So what happens at this point? At this point here, um, oh, so can I use red here? Right, so at this point here, this is the point negative one, one, right? So what does that mean? If T is negative one, Right, where is the first particle? The first particle is at negative 1, 1, right? But where's the second particle? Uh, oh, sorry, this should, be, this should be a vector, not a point, right? It's not a point, it's a vector now. Uh, so for you, where's the, where's the second particle, right? So let's see, t minus 2 is going to be negative 3, and then t is going to be negative 1. So notice that, right, for R, you're going to be where this red point is, the red, the red particle. It's, it's a vector from the origin, but it's at that point. But for you, you're going to be way over here somewhere, negative 3, negative 1. Yeah. So right here is the point negative 3, negative 1. So at this time, the two particles are in two different places, two different locations, right? And so something very similar happens at 2, 4, at this point up here, when one particle is there, the other particle will be somewhere else, will be at a different location, right? So their paths intersect, but the particles will not be there at the same time, right? So they're not going to collide. So yeah, think of all the, you know, think of the, the asteroids that are, you know, if, if, uh, if one gets a little too far away, you know, could become a meteor. And um, yeah, if it gets a little too close, uh, you know, that's not good. But, you know, and, and it's, it's probably a little disconcerting to say that there are actually plenty of asteroids uh, you know, that cross the paths of the orbit of the Earth. So this is the orbit of the Earth. Well, it's a little more circular than that. Right? So let's say this is the orbit of the Earth around the Sun. Right? There are going to be asteroids that cross the path of our orbit. Yeah, that's not, that's not a nice thought, right? Um, however, if the Earth is way over here somewhere and the asteroid is over here, then who cares, right? So the asteroid's not going to collide into the Earth just because the path crosses the, the path of the Earth around the Sun. The Sun being you know, somewhere in the middle here, pretty close to the center. Right. So that's the difference between where the particles are at a given time and then the geometric paths traced out by those particles, right. the curves themselves. Okay, so so yeah, I think I think that should help, and maybe maybe we'll do one more example, um, in just a second. Okay, so this I don't think this is there's one. Well, this this is from the homework, except I don't think I assigned this particular one, but maybe a similar one. Uh, so we're given two surfaces in space, right? The surfaces are, well, x squared plus y squared plus z squared equals 10. You should know what that is. And x plus y equals 4. You should know what that is. Um, and in fact, I think the, the book will actually want you to graph these. So I guess I'll do this in blue and that in green. And then uh, find a vector valued function, say r of t, uh, tracing out the curve that is the intersection of both of these surfaces. And they actually give you one of the parameterizations. They give you that x should be 2 plus sine t. 
Um, in fact, if they don't give you that, then it becomes a much harder problem. But as it is, I, don't, I think it's fairly reasonable. So, uh, yeah, so what are we talking about here? This is going to be... Let me see, is this the right? Yeah, I think this will work. Uh, so the first surface, of course, is just a sphere of radius, well, 3.1 something. It's the square root of 10. And it's so hard to draw on this. Let me try one more time here. Okay, that's, that's a lot better, right? So again, this is supposed to be a sphere. There we go. So that's the first one. The second one, x plus y equals 4, well, that, that's a plane, right? So, yes, this was a sphere, and this is a plane. Right? There's no z, so, you know, if you're looking down at the xy plane, right, the z-axis is coming out of the screen at you, then this is just, you know, y equals 4 minus x. So 1, 2, 3, 4, 1, 2, 3, 4. It's this plane here, right? So, yep, so if this is x equals 4 here. Oh, x equals 4 is outside the sphere, okay. But then the line connecting those intersects the sphere. So the plane is, oh gosh, can I do a vertical plane here? Straight up and down. So this is the plane that intersects the sphere. And it just it intersects it, but just barely, right? So the intersection might be something like this, right? Uh, so it could be a circle. Could be a circle. I think it is a circle, to be honest with you. A plane and a sphere should intersect in a circle. So, right, so how do we represent that circle parametrically now? Right, well, let's start with what they give us. They give us that x is equal to 2 plus sine of t. Okay, and we know y is going to be 4 minus x. So 4, 4 minus x is going to be 4 minus 2 plus sine t which is just 2 minus the sine of t. Okay, so, so far so good. We have x and y, now we need z. Uh, so what's z going to be? Well, right, there is no z for the plane. z could be anything. So it's got to be the same z that's on the sphere here. So we can solve this for z. Z squared is going to be 10 minus X squared minus Y squared. So Z will have to be plus or minus the square root of 10 minus X squared minus Y squared. Again, the plus or minus is a little bit irritating. However, you notice that right, the plus corresponds to the, the upper part of the circle, and then the minus corresponds to the, the bottom part of the circle. So I think we're not going to be able to really get away with, um, with the plus or minus here. Um, at least I, well, at least I hope so, right? Um, but let's see what happens, right? So if we plug in, um, yeah, if we plug in x and y here, what do we get? We get the z is plus or minus the square root of 10 minus x, but x is 2 plus sine t squared, right? Um, and then minus y squared, so that's 2 minus sine of t squared. Um, and that's it, but again, kind of a mess. So if we multiply it all out, we might get something a little bit nicer. So this is going to be minus 4 minus 4 sine t, and then minus sine squared of t. Right, Mess that up. 
All right, sine squared of t. And then for the, the second one here, this, the last term, we have minus 4 minus a negative, so plus 4 sine of t. And then minus a positive, right, minus sine squared of t. Um, yeah, I think that's it, right? So combine like terms. We get 10 minus 4 minus 4, which is 2. And then we have, I think, the negative 4 sine t, positive 4 sine t add up to 0. And finally, we have negative sine squared minus sine squared, so negative 2 sine squared of t. So if you factor out the square root of 2, you just get the square root of 1 minus sine squared. You might rec recognize that as just being cosine of t. So fair enough, right? So that, there's our z, uh, plus or minus the square root of cos uh, plus or minus the square root of 2 times the cosine of t. Right? Um, but here's the nice thing that I, th I think this works out nicely here, that I, I don't think we need the plus or minus now, because cosine can be positive or negative, right? And so depending on where your t is, I think your t will give you both a positive and negative. After all, I think even though they don't say this explicitly, t has to go from 0 to 2 pi. How do I know that, right? To get all the x's here, when you have 2 plus sine t, um, if you only go, say, from 0 to pi, I don't think you're going to get, you're going to hit all the x's, right? If you only go from 0 to pi over 2, you're not going to hit all the x's or the y's. So I think we have to go from 0 to 2 pi. And on that interval, cosine ranges from positive to negative. So luckily, if you forgot the plus or minus, you lucked out because I don't think we need it here. So our vector-valued function, r of t, will just be the following. It'll be 2 plus sine of t times i. Right? So that was given. And then we calculated y to be 2 minus the sine of t times j. And then plus the square root of 2 times cosine of t times k. And maybe we should specify that t ranges from 0 to 2 pi. So there you go. A little bit of algebra and a little bit of trigonometry. Um, but they give us all the information we need. It's just a matter of you know, using the, the given value of x in terms of t, the function of x in terms of t, to find y and z in terms of t as well. So that's, that's how that's done, right? And so, yes, this is going to be a circle. I know it looks elliptical here, but it should be a circle. Um, that's, you know, the, the intersection of the sphere and the plane. Right. I know it's very hard to see in the picture here, but, you know, here's your sphere, right? If you cut it off with a plane like this, right, then the intersection will be some sort of a circle. Um, yeah, unless the plane happens to be tangent to the sphere, if it just touches the sphere, you don't get a circle. You just get a single point, the point of intersection, right? right. On the other hand, if the plane doesn't intersect the sphere at all, then you don't get anything, right? Then, then it's empty. Empty space is the intersection. Okay. But in this case, the, the plane intersected the sphere just at the right angle to get this circle. So this is the parameterization of a circle in space, though, right? It's not a circle in a plane. It's a circle in space. That's why it has a z component. OK, so I think, uh, I think that should do it. That's about as hard as it's going to get in this section.